The eye of all the world, the ancients called it. The heart of a lost empire that had lasted for a thousand years and more. Saint Sophia, the Church of the Divine Wisdom. This was their crowning glory, the glory of Byzantium. Empire of Byzantium, born of pagan Rome. Byzantium, the dream of a Christian Roman Empire that stretched from Spain to Syria. Byzantium, whose influence ran from northern Russia down to Nubia upon the upper Nile. Byzantium, gateway to a lost chapter of our past. The Orient Express. I first travelled this line in the 60s. I bought a ticket at Waterloo Station in London for a ride to Istanbul in Turkey and a lifelong fascination. It took three days to get there. It was hell on wheels, really. Goats in the corridor and communism out the window. Then all of a sudden, the train swung round the bend and bang! The Orient hit me in the face. A great golden city by the sea set between the east and west. You could see it had been the centre of the world. It was astonishing. I'd come to Istanbul. And underneath, the magic ruins of the lost empire of Byzantium. The Orient Express stopped here, in the heart of the old city. I got off it in clouds of smoke and steam, haunted by the ghosts of Greta Garbo and Agatha Christie, by a thousand spies and archaeologists, by the kings and courtesans of pre-war Europe. Istanbul, one of the very greatest of Islamic cities. With the monuments of the conquering Turkish sultans, who had ruled here since 1453, dominating its skyline. Underneath, though, are much older ghosts. Brushed each day by people of the living city, the ruins of Constantinople, capital city of the Empire of Byzantium. Istanbul, Constantinople. Two names, new and old, for the same grand city. Sixteen centuries ago, in the year 330, the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Roman Emperor, chose this city, then a small Greek town, to be his capital. No one quite knows why. One thing sure, though. The great warrior emperors had left Rome and the cities of the West forever. This mosque, 
the mosque of the Turkish Sultan who conquered the city, is built straight on the foundations of the most ancient burial church of the mysterious emperors of old Byzantium. What then was this most ancient, half-forgotten empire? The Empire of Byzantium. Byzantium. That magic, spicy word. Now, imagine that the empires of Greece and Rome had never died, but had been fused together in a single empire set between the East and West. And imagine that the emperors of this kingdom, the sacred emperors, could be torn to pieces by the mobs in the street. Emperors who could mutilate their courtiers and children, could kill their priests and blind whole armies of invaders. Yet emperors whose artists made some of the most finest, the most exquisite images the world has ever seen. Visions of heaven and earth, sublime architectures, copied by everybody from the caliphs of Baghdad to the popes of Rome, the kings of Germany and the tribes of Nubia. Visions of heaven's order and earthly power that still lie deep within the modern world. Just as this mosque, the Conqueror's Mosque, stands on the ruins of Byzantium, so do we all. This is where the empire of Byzantium began, beside this ancient column here on Main Street. A lonely ancient relic in a modern city. In the year of our Lord 330, on a lovely May morning, a great procession came down this road. It was the highway of an ancient city called Byzantium. And the procession was led by the great Roman Emperor Constantine. And he'd brought with him a bunch of priests, pagan and Christian ones, and they were all holding an incredible collection of relics. There were 12 baskets filled with crumbs, the residue, it was said, of our Lord's miracle of the loaves and fishes. There was the very axe that Noah made the ark with. And there was a statue that the Emperor himself had brought secretly from Rome, a statue of the Greek god Pallas. And at an exact moment prescribed by astrologers, they buried their relics just over there, at the foot of the column. Seven drums of porphyry brought from the Egyptian deserts. And Constantine renamed the city Constantinople and claimed it as the capital of his grand new empire. You know, over the years, the column itself came to be seen as a relic. And the Byzantines, that's the people who lived in this city, called it Christ's Nail because they thought that the great golden statue of Constantine upon the top had something of one of the nails from Christ's crucifixion built into it. And every year on the New Year's Day, that's the 1st of September, the Byzantines turned up at the bottom of this column and sung hymns to Saint Constantine, the founder of their city and the mighty empire called Byzantium. Constantinople was designed to be the center of the Christian world, the center of Christ's government on earth. These great cups were made to hold the mystery of Christ's blood inside the city's churches, churches glowing with Roman gold and ancient holy images, images that for a thousand years flooded right through Europe and the East. This, then, is Byzantium's first story, the story of how, in two short centuries, a dream was made. The dream that was Byzantium. Constantine, the Christian emperor, the man who took the faith of Jesus and the God of Abraham 
and created the beginning of the governments and churches in which the West still trusts. He was crowned, they say, at York in England in 306. For 40 years, he had killed foes and family alike, and when he died, people were so frightened of him that no one touched his body for a week. This was the extent of Constantine's ambition. The late Roman Empire, with Constantinople, not Rome, as its capital. And in the far north, in Germany, the city of Trier, a great imperial garrison. It still shows something of what ancient Constantinople used to look like. The city gate, still guarding the main road into town. A great grim gate. Like the rest of the northern frontier, Trier was continuously threatened by Huns and Goths and Vandals and a dozen other warrior nations. Constantine the Great, the Emperor himself, would have walked down this same passage 1,600 years ago. These vaults and arches are the architecture of his time. Once you were through the gate, most Roman towns look much the same. They were, if you like, a sort of an abstract idea of a city, and they were stamped on every landscape from Yorkshire to Syria. You can still sense their design in a thousand old world cities, and in the new world too. From Washington to San Francisco, planners still use parts of the same old patterns. All Roman towns had roads like this one. Wide thoroughfares that took you from the country to the heart of the city. This one is at Palmyra in the Syrian desert. For Constantinople, it was called, quite simply, the main road. Now, what you've got to see is that behind all these columns, there are little rows of shops running down the sides of the street. Butchers, bakers, candle makers, all sorts of people. In Constantinople, it would have had the goods of the known world. Africa, China, the Baltic, everything was for sale. Just imagine, the emperor, he's coming in in triumph, he's won a war and he's coming through the gate. The shopkeepers have been told to dust down the streets. Flowers have been strewn all over the pavements. Roses are raining down upon him. There are rugs and silks fluttering in the breezes all around him. The whole town has been sucked out to come and see him. Behind, of course, behind the main street, are all the town houses, servants, soldiers, all the people. There were taverns, brothels, everything in a city. And in amongst those, studded in amongst those, were those huge buildings that Constantine had to build before his city could really be called a Roman metropolis. It's only a little building, but it was actually the heart of ancient Palmyra. It's the Senate, the Oval Office, where government was conducted, where the town elders met, where plots were hatched, all that sort of thing. Of course, in Constantine's great imperial cities, this would have been a vast long hall. And quite often, in the central hall of government, great Constantine himself would have sat, where now the altars of Christian churches stand, because this is basically the same building. In the year 360, Constantine's son built a magnificent church at Constantinople especially for the drama of imperial communion. Next door, those same pious emperors built a giant racetrack, the Hippodrome. You can still see part of its outline in the streets. And here at last, around this old Egyptian obelisk, you can discover something of the atmosphere of ancient Constantinople. 
the heart of old Byzantium. This stone's like a giant mirror, reflecting all the life that once went on around it. There's the emperor and his family, Constantine's successors, come to the royal box to start a chariot race. There's the obelisk in the middle of the racetrack, and the chariots too, eight of them running all at once. You need a lot of luck to win. This place wasn't just a racetrack though. This is a place where people met the emperor and his court. It's the air, the space of Byzantium. A hundred thousand people roaring as new emperors are presented to them, as captives from foreign wars are brought and thrown at the feet of the emperor. It's the old parliament. It's the real heart of Byzantium. And that scene there, where have you seen it before? Look at it carefully. The emperor's in the middle with his family just like God. Around them stand the army and the court, just like the saints. Beneath them, begging mercy, are Byzantium's enemies, the damned. It's a grand last judgment right here on earth with the emperor playing God. So that's it really. The emperor brings happiness and harmony. The theater brings luck and victory. This is the center of the world, an image, you might say, of heaven on earth. So if we'd have pushed open the gates of the imperial palace that once stood beside the Hippodrome, we'd have really been opening the earthly gates of paradise. Arcades of gold and marble, silver boats on pools of mercury, silk carpets, golden thrones in halls of porphyry and pearls. All are gone. Only echoes of them still remain in Syria and Italy. Once, though, Constantinople held the palace of all palaces, the palace of the Christian Empire. Church, Hippodrome and Palace, Constantine had made a sacred engine that would power Byzantium forever. To protect the holy city of Constantinople, the emperors of Byzantium built the largest city walls in all the world. Armies that controlled the lives of millions rode from these gates. And through them, passed the produce of an empire. The whole history of this city is in this gate. The great golden gate of Imperial Byzantium. You see that great high span at the top? That was once open to the skies. For 600 years, emperors and armies rode through that gate in triumph, coming back from wars against the Persians, the Arabs, the Bulgarians, the Russians. Then there was an earthquake. The gate was blocked. And that final gate at the bottom, that even a cavalryman couldn't come through on a horse, that gate was built in the final years of Byzantium. So this is a magic gate. It's a gate of legends. They say its wooden doors were covered with sheets of gold to give the gate its name. They say that the very last emperor killed fighting on these walls is buried beneath these stones, waiting for a call to take the city once again. So it's a gate of legend, but above all, it speaks of imperial Byzantine power. Power to control innumerable lives. You know, there are thousands of blocks in this gate, and each one of them, each tiny mark upon them, made by an individual human hand. Endless lives absorbed in making millions of these blocks. Enough to build the whole city of Constantinople. Now this snowy marble, strange grey lines running through it, 
is found all over the Byzantine Empire, from Spain to Syria and back to Constantinople. But it comes from one island only, one tiny island in the sea. Southwest of Istanbul, three days sailing on an ancient slave ship, is the Isle of Marmara. Its very name means stone. In the first centuries of Byzantium, slaves in their tens of thousands worked in these marble hills. How the Byzantines love marble. In marble, says a priest, God trapped fields of flowers and mountain forests and fish and fruit and melting snows. The ancient blocks still strewn across the quays hint at the frantic energy that was once used to move their precious stone. Still inside the modern quarries, an ancient stone that weighs around a hundred tons, part of an enormous column to memorialize the military victories of Byzantium. If it were finished, it would have had a spiral staircase cut in it and rows of sculptured soldiers on its turning surface. It's still here, though. It cracked as it was quarried. In ancient times, these quarries were called the quarries of the Mother of God. They might just as well have been called the quarries of the Mother of Constantinople. The whole city was made here, and it was prefab city. It wasn't just sent off in blocks, everything was finished. If these had been finished and gone to Constantinople, each one had been lettered, it had its exact place in, in every one of the ancient buildings of the city. This, for example, is the very tip of a building that would have looked like a Roman temple. Modern quarry masters tell me that they find the best new seams of marble in the hills beside the ancient stones. This would be a good spot then. A giant lonely column shaft. I've seen that same shape, a so-called peacock's feather pattern, cut on a broken column lying right on the main street of old Istanbul. This was once a marble square on a highway at the middle of Constantinople. I don't suppose the Turks of modern Istanbul think much about ancient Byzantine victories. Yet there's still some fragments here of that great memorial column that made it all the way from Marmara. The ghosts of the imperial armies still lining the roots of their processions through the city. Just as all the ancient roads and sea lanes ran through the empire to Constantinople, so did the rivers of the region, channeled into great aqueducts, bringing treasured water to a thirsty city. Underneath the town, cut deep into its hilltop, an eerie underworld, some 15 centuries old, 
fresh water cisterns, so that the Byzantines could bathe just like the Romans did, in marble halls. And everything made with the dazzling technology of ancient Rome, the father of Byzantium. Marble columns, high brick vaults, the dark forests of Byzantium beneath modern Istanbul. Those Greek letters hammered into the column with a chisel point, the marks of one of Marmara's quarrymen. Food, too, flooded into the enlarging city. What a vast logistic exercise, an earthly miracle, supporting Constantinople's half a million people, Europe's biggest city, and everything, of course, by hand. There was no food industry. Everything was carried here in boats and carts. The finest fish, the Byzantines believed, were caught beside the emperor's palace, between the rising of the Pleiades and the setting of the blood-red star Arcturus. Colors, smells and textures of the ancient everyday. The raw ingredients of Byzantine experience. The world of the ancient Mediterranean. Just like the people of modern Istanbul, the Byzantines loved fresh bread and fresh vegetables. Well, the bread, at least the grain for it, they brought from their province of Egypt. The vegetables they grew themselves. In little plots beside their houses in the city, in fields in a great green swathe that ran for mile upon mile down the walls of the city. And here's still a bit of it today, growing more or less the same crops. Look at the garlic, the onions, the dill. The dill they use to flavour fish, especially those heavy yellow fish soups they so love. And this, well, this is an ecological Byzantine delight here. There's three or four different sorts of crocs. There's rocket for salad. There's chard and cabbage again. All sorts of things, mint, all growing together in a great profusion. And at the end of it all, lettuce to calm your stomach. So when the peasants in the fields just stop there for a moment and straighten their backs to watch the lords of Byzantium, those great history makers riding by, they too could think, we're not having such a bad time either. The Byzantine economy was based on the classic Mediterranean diet. Wine, grain, cheese and vegetables and olives. Olive oil was a staple. It was Byzantium's fuel. It lit streets and homes and lighthouses. It oiled carts and cured baldness. And it was used for cooking. In its first centuries, Constantinople's oil came mostly from northern Syria. This is a wonderful thing. It's a piece of Byzantine industrial archaeology. It's a factory for making olive oil. This is a marvellous little place. I'll show you how it works. It's very sensible, very logical. The olives were picked from the trees. They came down that little street in wagons. They were tipped down through a window, and they fell into that trough down there. They were then scooped out of the trough and put into this mill. This is a great oil press for the berries. You see this drum? There were two of those, they fitted on end in here, side by side, a bar went between them, and four or five men pushed round the outside and reduced the olives, the skin, and the stone into a sort of horrible, messy pulp. That then was taken out of there and laid in these circles here. Now this thing in the wall here held a great beam that ran through the air. 
and hanging above this was a huge cylinder of stone. And that then was slowly dropped onto the massive olive paste and the oil dripped down into these tanks. Not the end, because this, after all, although it's cold-pressed, is actually a very impure oil at this moment. So they take it out of here and they put it into this tank here. Now, this tank has already got water in it. So as they pour the olive oil in, it floats to the surface. All of the impurities go down to the bottom. And see this little trench here? A vital piece of gourmet equipment. Because this is where the very finest oil ran from that impurity tank down into this tank to make fine, clear olive oil for the tables of Byzantium. This is Sigilla, one of 300 ancient Syrian villages with Byzantine olive groves. Provincial Byzantium, preserved in fine cut stone. Just off the main square is the public bathhouse, forerunner of the Turkish bath. St. John cast whores and devils out of one of these. This is Sigilla's Cafe come Town Hall down on Main Street. Old soldiers and half-mad saints got drunk in bars like this. Moneylenders, magistrates and merchants did their business here. Can you hear the farmers, tough, independent homesteaders, chuckling about the prices that the city folk were paying for their olive oil? Life was very good. There was time for both the devil and his baths and for the church and all its works. If you'd have come up this path 1,500 years ago on the 1st of September, you'd have been accompanied by thousands of people shouting and singing praises to the Lord. It was the feast day of St. Simon of the Pillar. The first place these processions came to was this great baptistry. 10,000 people, whole cities full, had been baptised in this room in a single day. And then out they all went, praising the Lord, onwards to the Church of the Saint. It's Roman architecture still, of course. Arches, vaults and column tops. But now, there's Christian crosses too. The ancient forms are turning into something else. See? The wind of faith is bending all those ancient pagan patterns. This is the style that would become Byzantium. And at the church's hub, the remains of the 50-foot column on which St Simon lived. So who was this weird man who lived up a pillar and half the world had come to see him? When he died, they built this beautiful dancing church in his honour. Well, as a young man, Simon had worn clothes so rough they'd made him bleed. And then he dreamt up the idea of chaining his left leg to a large rock. That before he went up the column. But Simon wasn't a nutter. Simon had tremendous presence like an emperor. He sat still and silent. And in these contests between flesh and the devil, it seemed to most people that he was beyond touch. And there he was on his pillar, halfway between heaven and earth, a perfect man to settle disputes. So they used Simon. The farmers of Syria would come here when they were in arguments and he would settle one against the other. The Bedouin, the Arab Bedouin came to see him too. The emperor used to come to see him and always he acted as a balance in society. Such a terrifying balance that if he cursed somebody from the top of his pillar, a rock would explode next to the unfortunate individual. So Simon, it was a vital element in this new Christian empire. An element which somehow had taken the old stern order of the Roman age and left it 
halfway between heaven and earth. In the eastern Mediterranean, in the warm heartland of the pagan world, the first Christian empire, the empire of Byzantium, had found its balance. It was a good life, a rich life, and there was peace and plenty. You know, it always strikes me as funny when people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire. After all, standing here in Constantinople, it just got richer and richer and richer. It didn't fall at all. I suppose really it's because Rome fell. In fact, Rome didn't fall, it just got poor. Constantine had moved the capital from the great old cities of the west to here in the east, and with him moved the government, the generals, the artists and the architects. Everybody who made the empire moved with him. So in 475, that's 25 years after these walls were finished, the last Roman emperor of the west, a young man, a junior emperor, sent the crown back here to Constantinople, to New Rome. This was the new city. Now, I suppose, really, the story about the fall of the Roman Empire, that's the Western Empire, was really invented in the Renaissance by the popes, who really wanted to get the idea of a pagan empire falling and the Christian Empire of the West rising. They're good propagandists like Raphael and Michelangelo to budge them on their way. But the truth is, the real truth is, that old Rome, ancient Rome, had been modelled on the great cities of the East, on Antioch and Alexandria, all those great marble cities. So when you say Rome fell, it didn't fall at all. It simply went back home again. After the last emperor of the West resigned, Byzantium lost most of its European provinces. Only for a century, though, by the year 555, brand new Byzantine armies had ruthlessly reconquered some of them. And in northern Italy at Ravenna, they left triumphant decorations in this church as their memorial. The man there is Justinian, the emperor who 200 years after Constantine completely remade the Roman Empire the man who made Byzantium. He was a man, they said, who was gentle and approachable, a man who never showed his anger, a man who in the quietest of voices could order the death of thousands. He didn't organize the empire completely by himself, though. His great strength was as a manager. Those strong faces that surround him were the faces of a great team of men he'd picked together. And he didn't really care whether they were Roman patricians or from the humblest, roughest backgrounds. He himself actually come from a completely illiterate peasant family in Serbia. Justinian, though, was only half the picture. The other half was that most remarkable woman over there, the Empress Theodora. They'd married each other for love and they stayed together for 25 years. And look at the young ladies of the court there. They're looking sideways and a bit nervous. You see, it's not proper for young girls to look straight at you, not unless you're a woman of power like Theodora. But that is actually a portrait of a woman dying of cancer. Within two or three months of this mosaic being finished, Theodora was dead. Justinian ruled for another 20 years, he never remarried, and he went to her grave and lit candles until he was a very old man. Though Justinian and Theodora restored the Roman Empire, this was no longer the ancient classical world. They lived in a different age, spoke Eastern Greek instead of Roman Latin, and viewed the world in very different ways. Look at these sculptures. They're probably the last classical figures ever made. They were made actually in the generations just before Justinian. Now at first glance, 
You might think they're just part of those usual old classical things you see hanging around museums. Big stony Alexanders and Caesars all strutting their stuff. But they're not like that at all. They're new, they're different. Something else is going on. It's very simple work, very realistic in a way. Little light cut lines and a day old beard lightly chiseled on the hard marble as if to emphasize its transience, its insubstantiality. These people are pensive, sad, and rather wise. After all, hadn't the saints and bishops told them that this life, this material world, was only an illusion. So naturally, these statues don't strut their stony stuff like Alexander or the emperors of Rome. They are not heroic descriptions of skin and bone and straining muscle. Each man stands inside his own mysterious inner space that each one of us must occupy. And from that space, they look outwards from the soul towards the heavens. As you might expect, if you should move around them, the solid bulk of marble and humanity is seen to be nothing more than an illusion. These brand new people, though, were clever and inventive, too. Many of them were drawn here, to the centre of the empire. Most of Byzantium's brightest brains were packed into these tiny streets and apartments that surrounded the palace complex in Constantinople. There were people here come to seek their fortune at the court from all over the empire, from Spain, from Egypt, from Syria. There were mathematicians, lawyers, doctors, scientists, magicians, alchemists, all sorts of weird and wonderful people packed and living tightly together in these little streets. In the 520s and 530s, there was a great excitement bubbling up inside this unique community. Justinian and Theodora had planned to build new palaces and churches such as the world had never seen. The ancient forms, arches, vaults and column tops, were being used for something revolutionary. Something that will be echoed in 10,000 different churches for a thousand years and more. The style that is Byzantium. This seaside church, set right beside the palace, was made for some of Theodora's favorite priests. It was probably the work of one Anthemius, a famous physician and mathematician. This was where the style began. Theodora built the church to hold the blood-stained cloaks and bodies of two martyred soldiers, Sergius and Bacchus, the army's patron saints. Now it's a mosque. Anthemia's subtle compass has transformed all the usual ancient forms. Squares become circles, circles octagons, and all around a single central point. Space spins into ever smaller spaces. It's as perfectly mysterious as the finest natural crystal. The walls, the columns, seem to be nothing more than an illusion and simply fade away.
Just look at that great big glorious dome, like a huge melon, divided into 16 sections and held by eight wonderful swinging arches on those extraordinary V-shaped pillars and 28 columns through the church. It's like a vast net of stone and brick slung over this central space, this strange, mysterious space for the Imperial Communion. It's a wonderful piece of architecture and it sold all sorts of problems that you can't even see. You see, those low domes exert tremendous pressure and there's a force in this building to push the bottom of it out so the whole thing comes crashing down. Now, Anthemius, like every other architect, has used stone here as lintels and beams, as stress and strains, the old way of doing things. But he's come up with a brilliant idea to hold the church together. And it's this cornice. This huge, beautiful marble cornice with its inscription to Justinian and Theodora. This isn't just here for decoration. This links the church in a chain. It binds the stones together. A great necklace for the church, brought from a shining island in a bright blue sea. Throughout Justinian's long reign, the Marmara quarries were hard at work, shipping stone for a new crop of imperial churches. This was building on a grand scale, churches for every country in the empire. But the biggest of them all was a new church for the Imperial Communion at Constantinople. For this, the quarry masters were cutting larger and yet larger versions of Anthemius's clever interlocking corners. Here's a piece of one of those stone chains under construction. And here's its secret. Each block was held to the next block by a great iron bracket held in lead that ran between the two stones. And Themis's engineers use rather a lot of iron in their buildings. It's part of a whole new series of techniques that allow them to think more daringly, more bravely than any other architects have done before. Above all, it enabled Justinian himself to have the ambition to conceive of the greatest dome the world has ever seen. Such mysterious cargoes, such magic marbles from across the empire, now sailed the seas and came to the holy city of Byzantium to be gathered up upon the site of the Imperial Communion. This is the finished dream, the tense climax of all of ancient engineering, a lively frame built with prayer and pragmatism to hold the largest dome the world had ever seen. This, though, is just the outside of a sacred theatre. Inside, a forest of columns rises up in ecstasy. The walls, glass and gold and marble, light and dark, insubstantial and illusory, seem to simply fade away. A perfect sea of space for God's holy wisdom to come down and touch the earth. A perfect theatre for the anthems of Byzantium. Lo, the lords of heaven and earth have come. Blood-red columns of Egyptian porphyry were taken, so it was said, from the Temple of the Sun at Rome. The church's wooden doors from Noah's Ark. The building's bronze was stripped from the Temple of the Goddess Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the pagan world. No wonder that the building has itself become a legend. Poets said 
The church combined the size of sunset and the scale of quarries. The hues of birds and fish and precious stones. All the textures and experience of that ancient everyday. The living pink of baby's fingernails. The rising of the bright red star Arcturus. In Byzantine, in Greek, this church was called the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. All of Justinian's enormous empire, its wealth, its piety, its pagan heritage, was gathered up inside it. Throughout the next nine centuries, this vast old building stood right at the center of Byzantium, a symbol of its true destiny on earth. And on the last day of Byzantium, the emperor and his troops came here to pray before they walked out onto the city walls to die. For these were the vaults that held the dream, the dream that was Byzantium.